Hello and welcome. My name is Rosella Garcia and I'm the Senior Director of Alumni Relations at Teachers College. And I'd like to thank you for joining us today for this virtual presentation brought to you by Alumni Relations as part of TC's Come Together Right Now virtually series. We're grateful to the alumni who have shared their time and expertise to help us create these meaningful and engaging programs for the TC community this year. I would like to introduce today's featured guest speakers, alumna Maya Moore Eyrick and TC trustee Charles Desmond, better known to us as Charlie. Maya, a TC alumna who earned her MA in 2006, joined Merrill Private Wealth Management in 2020 to found the IRIC Group. She focuses on providing wealth planning strategies to successful individuals and families navigating sudden wealth. Charlie joined TC's Board of Directors in 2018, and he is the CEO of Inversant, the largest parent-centered children's savings account initiative in the Commonwealth. He's the past chair of the Massachusetts Board of Higher Education and a proud TC dad. His daughter, Desi, is a current doctoral student at Teachers College. Today, they'll be engaging in a conversation that will provide us insights for building our own financial confidence. So without further ado, Maya and Charlie. Thanks, Rosella. Appreciate your kind words and your very nice introductions. I'm so happy to be uh, in this conversation today and talking with Maya. She's such a distinguished graduate and doing such wonderful work. And so, um, uh, Maya, you know, what I thought would be good today is if we sort of began, if you're saying a little bit about yourself. I mean, yeah, tell us a little bit more about kind of what your background is and something we might not read in a bio that, or something that Rosella might have just said about you. No, thank you, Charlie. And first, I want to start out by thanking Teachers College for having me back on campus, whether it's, you know, virtually. Um, unfortunately, we can't be in person, but I'm thankful for this opportunity. TC has just played such a large role in my life and in my professional and personal development. Um, I think that Rosella pretty much read a lot about my background, but maybe something that you wouldn't find on my bio. I grew up in rather humble beginnings on the island of Oahu. Um, I was born and raised there, and I was born into a multiracial family. So my father is black and my mother is Korean and white. And even though I grew up with rather humble beginnings and didn't necessarily have a lot, um, something that was instilled in me at a very young age was strong work ethic, integrity, um, the whole concept of that, that it's about more than me and just putting education at the forefront. So for me, that's really helped inform a lot of the decisions I've made as a professional um, and then something else that I'm really proud of is that I'm a first generation college graduate. And so I hope that gives hope and inspiration to a lot of people that may be on that come from similar circumstances that I did. Wow, that's really great. Um, learned a little bit more than I knew myself because I thought I had read your whole complete bio. But you see, th this is the good part about these conversations. And I know that um, everyone that's tuned in today is um, just happy to learn a little bit more about you. And especially being first gen, because there's so many, sometimes there's so many limitations that get in the way of success. And you, you sometimes may not think that's possible to achieve the heights that you've achieved, but it's clearly the case that you can get there. Um, so um, you've been, this unique journey that you've been on took you through Teachers College where you were on staff uh, for a while at the college. Can you share a little bit about how that work at Teachers College somehow led to you choosing financial coaching as your career path? No, thank you. And I appreciate you describing it as financial coaching, because a lot of people in my industry and a lot of those on online today might think of it more as wealth management. But really, I mean, I'm in the business of coaching around financial and life events. And I haven't strayed that far from my time at TC. I'm still in the business of education and empowerment. My upbringing that I described before and, and my parents really taught me what it means to be an advocate, but TC really helped me understand what it means to be an advocate for others. So how to use my, my seat at the table. But to answer your question around financial coaching and wealth management, I wanted, simply put, I wanted to be able to lead, help others lead purposeful, fulfilled lives. And I know that people can do that um, when utilizing their financial resources, but I wanted to be the one to educate them and empower them to do so and in this fashion and realize how they could have a bigger impact through, through their wealth. So my role really allows me to help other, others big, build 
a long-term plan of some sort. And it allows me to help them realize how they're going to utilize you know, their impact to support their families and broader their communities. Thank you. That's just uh, exactly what I was probing at. Um, this next question kind of goes in two different, different directions. And so I, I, I hope that maybe you'll just take a few minutes and try both answer both for me. Um, because I think our listening audience is going to be comprised of, you know, a cross section of people that are involved with TC. On the one hand, I know that um, in your field, you're, you work with high net worth individuals, they come to you, they have a, a unique set of issues that sometimes they bring to the table with regards to uh, coaching and the kinds of issues that they're concerned about. And on the one hand, high net worth pe people uh, are advised to get advisors. <laughs> so that's one thing. The second group are folks that are on the path. They may be first gens, uh, they're in school right now, or recently graduating, they may be calling carrying um, debt or something like that. Um, so what kinds of coaching and going both directions here, what kinds of issues and concerns might you most focus when you're working with high net worth folks? And what kinds of issues and obstacles might you look at and be concerned about when you're looking for first time folks who are getting involved? So as, as I mentioned, I came from humble beginnings and I definitely know a thing or two about having a ton of student loans, right? Um, Thankfully, uh, those are paid off, but I think that we all basically start out at the same place. And so whether it's a family that has millions of dollars or a new college graduate gra from graduate school or even undergrad, they may have student debt. It all comes down to three things, at least in my mind. So the first is understanding and realizing what your impact will be, right? Understanding why you're here, what your role is and who, what legacy that you want to leave. So I think that impact and your purpose are really those driving forces for all decisions in your life. And I'm sure we'll end up talking, I know you're going to probe me on this, we'll talk about it a little bit more. But so regardless of what your balance sheet looks like or how much you have, you need to think about the impact that you want to have and be purposeful with that, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing I really believe is it doesn't matter if you have $5, $100 or $1,000 or a million dollars, you need to have a long-term financial plan of some sort. Some type of document, and you can do this yourself on a simple sheet of paper, where you're listing out all of your assets and all of your liabilities and your short and long-term goals. And it doesn't have to be something incredibly fancy. It can be a back of the napkin type of thing, but you need to have it written down because then it becomes a, a reality, right? You're putting it out into the universe and it's forcing you to think about this is what I'm working towards and this is what I'm currently working with. So everyone needs to have that plan. So impact and purpose, the plan. And then the third thing, I think in particular for people that are just starting out, this may look a little different, but it's relevant even to some of the families that I coach and work with that have been wealthy for multiple generations. You need to have some kind of budgeting strategy. And so as the wealth grows, we might then call it something a little bit different, like a cash flow strategy. But you need to know where all of your after-tax income, where it's going. So it's, a, it's really a strategy that I think of as 50, 30, 20. 50% 50 of your income after tax income should be directed toward essential needs. Essential is the key word for all of us, which is really hard, right? Housing, which may look a little bit different if you're in New York or one of the big cities. Um, food, transportation to get to and from work, not transportation to go to you know, other types of events or whatnot, things like that. And then utilities, so 50%, 30%, should be things that are more of those, you know, the want. Maybe upgrading your phone, the latest gadget, upgrading your car, depending on who you are. So, you know, that really varies. And then designated 20% of your income to more of that savings and investing bucket. So whether it's an emergency fund or long-term savings, um, you know, your retirement strategy, whatever it may be, but having some kind of budgeting and cash flow plan of some sort. So I think everyone should be thinking about their impact and purpose. Everyone should make sure that they have some type of long-term financial plan, and then everyone should have some kind of budget or cash flow plan of some sort. So all of those things would be helpful to anyone at any point in their lives. It just may look a little bit different, and you may have different advisors involved at different points. Um, that's those that excellent, excellent um, observations. Um, I want to switch back again to the, the, the folks who um, may have 
resolve their financial problems. They're, they themselves have solved their problems uh, financially, but they have children and they're not sure how, how, how does coaching help uh, folks get through, through that process? I mean, I was reading Charlie Collier's book, Wealth and Families, and it's totally focused on the fact that once you sort of settle down and get your financial house in order, now you've got to try to figure out how do I get the next generation so that they're leading, my children are leading purposeful lives, that the, the, the wealth doesn't get in the way of their understanding that there's things that they can do in life that can make a difference for them in the world. And so, so how, how do you bring people into that conversation so that they feel comfortable with it and that, that they can benefit for, from what your team can share with them? Right. No, and I think that's a great question. And it's, it's interesting because I think what tends to happen is we, in all aspects of our life, we get this promotion, we get additional income, we, um, you know, realize our dream number, whatever that number is, so that we don't have to work multiple jobs, right? We were talking about this early, Charlie. Yes. But what tends to happen is that people think they figured it out. But really, when it comes to your financial situation, yes, you can have a plan, but you need to revisit that plan often and yeah. regularly. So yeah. even if someone feels like they're in a great situation, they have to probably continue to stay re-engaged, yes. But then when it comes to the next generation, I believe in starting those conversations very, very young. Um, some people, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, as you know, Charlie, I have three small children, right? They're two, four, and six. And I've started having conversations about money, about saving, about giving, sharing, investing at very young ages. Three-year-old is when I first started the first conversation. And I think it's about meeting people, meeting your children where they're at and speaking to them in a very respectful manner, but realizing they probably understand a lot more than you think, but just making it digestible for them. So I don't uh, encourage people to wait until their children are adults. I think you should have these conversations young and it doesn't have the weight doesn't all have to be on you all the time it's not that you have to come up with this set curriculum around financial literacy they're watching every habit everything you do around your values yes. so that's key everything doesn't have to be about going on these extravagant family vacations it can be about you know we're going on a mission trip or how are we going to do a staycation and instead support you know a local nonprofit that may help need help with a food drive like and these things can be done with your children at a young age, but believe it or not, and, and you already know this, this is what they look for at a very young age. And this in, is directly teaching them about financial literacy, but also being very open. I bring my children to the bank to deposit a $1 bill from the tooth fairy. Because then it gives me the opportunity to have the conversation around what is the bank? How does the bank work? What's the purpose of this? Where does my money go? All of those things will help. And you have lots of opportunities to have these discussions through their entire life. So I think starting early and having conversations often is key and making it happen, part of the habit. I think that that's absolutely wonderful advice. Thank you very much. So switch back over to the other side of the house now. That is for folks who are uh, just getting on with their careers. They're looking at the kinds of issues that we're talking about right now. So one point is, is that sometimes when you're starting a career, you don't think I need a financial coach. Um, so, uh, at one, I don't make enough money. Uh, I've got too many issues that are right in front of me. And it's, it's an extravagant to think about getting a financial coach. And so my, not that I'm an expert at this, which I'm not, but I would, I would, I would say just from my own experience that this is exactly the time when you need to have a coach. And there's a reason why wealthy people have coaches because they give them information that they might not have themselves. So what, why is it important? I mean, why, is, why would you say it's important early on for people who are be just beginning the journey of getting the job, getting that first promotion, as you said, getting a little bit of cash flow, that's the time when they should really be coming to see you for what, why would you suggest that? So um, it's, it's interesting how you framed it and what you, what you said. So there are lots of different types of advisors, right? It doesn't always have to be someone that's a financial coach or like me, a wealth management advisor there's lots of different types of people that can help guide you to make informed decisions. And so one of the tips that I give, especially women that I speak with that are just coming up or even the, some of the most senior level executives is you need to surround yourself with people that can be on your team that share your values. I think that's one of the most important things. 
So when you're vetting different advisors, it's, you have to make sure that they have the same values as you and they have your best interests at heart. So that's the key when you're looking for these advisors. But you can find these advisors in lots of different places and they're gonna help you to protect and preserve your wealth in ways that you did not even realize were possible. So for example, if you have a basic checking account, they have local investment specialists and advisors that sit in the branch. So it's easy enough for you to go in and have a conversation with someone. There's always somebody at your reach. You just need to be eyes wide open and be looking and be intentional about finding those people. Alternatively, when you get your first job and you have a 401k or 403b or whatever it may be, the retirement plan, whatever your company retirement plan is, they have advisors that you can call on the 1-800 number. So I think it's being open to learning about new things that may feel uncomfortable early on. And then as you have come up, start selecting advisors that match your values, but also match your need, because you may outgrow those advisors. I definitely outgrew my accountant, right? Mm -hmm. I definitely outgrew my financial advisor from when I was young because I became them, right? So <laughs> it looks different for different people, but if you don't surround yourself with the people early on, then you're gonna make mistakes and you may not take advantage of some opportunities, either from a tax perspective, um, an investment perspective, that you know and then you'll miss opportunities to be able to grow your wealth or even be able to come up with a plan for yourself so i hope that answered your question it did actually and i, I appreciate that very much um and related to that um you know in your case you're not a standalone person working by yourself you've got other experts that you work with who have expertise is expertise in areas where where you don't so your team is broad enough to be able to sort of help if something doesn't resonate with you you can pass it on to a team member who might be able to lead them in a, in a different direction or a thread that might be important today but may not be important five years from now right i mean i think that's the other key thing about finding an advisor that matches your values because they're also going to understand that they're not going to know everything so if they don't have other trusted people with the similar values out there that they can you know call or direct you to or introduce you to as a reference point, then that's probably not the right advisor for you. So as you're looking for people to surround yourself with, um, it's very important that you have those people that share your values, but also that have these high expectations around who they surround themselves with. Other people with good values, but other people that are incredibly smart. Um, I like that. Um, I also resonated to the point that you mentioned earlier, which is around impact, purpose, and plan. And so um, when you talk about leading a purposeful life, it, 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 what do you mean by that? Can you, can you unpack that a little bit for me? Yeah, so I believe that strongly that purpose is what drives all of us. Understanding your why, what you want your legacy to be, and can and should really impact your habits and all of your decisions. So when you think about creating a financial plan, whether you're creating it yourself or creating it with an advisor, you need to account for how to accomplish or realize your purpose and impact through your resources. Your, your finances and your resources are a common thread that connect all of your priorities. So by thinking through your purpose and your impact, and really, it really helps you to frame and form habits and your plan around thing, those things to become more clear. And I'll give you an example. So, you know, I, I work with and I partner with an executive, female executive, and she's really told me her whole purpose is to, and her impact that she wants to have is to ensure that women and girls get access to, you know, equal education. And she's a strong supporter of women and girls. So when we went to create this financial plan for her, you know, we talked about how, her charitable giving and how to align her charitable intent and her philanthropy. And it wasn't a lot at the beginning, right? She wasn't always the senior executive with her purpose. So giving to women's and girls organizations, the YWCA entities that really were gonna support that, right? And then the second thing, when I went over her financial plan, a typical advisor may not do this, but this for me is very, I'm very purpose and impact driven. So when I talk about her spend, I said, it's great. Yes, you're not really spending, you know, as much as you probably thought after we looked at her um, spending income, but how you're spending can also directly go back to your purpose and impact. And she said, well, what do you mean by that? I said, well, how do you decide on which companies to support? 
-hmm. And she said, oh, I don't really think about that. I look at, you know, what's convenient to me and things like that. I said, well, maybe start spending and supporting the companies that are women owned, right? Or that have women in the C-suite. And now she re-diverts a lot of her spend when she does corporate gifts at the end of the year. Everything is aligned with her purpose. And it would take it a step further, right? So we have the charitable giving and then we have the spend. And then this last really key space, her impact investing, how she invests. So we realigned her investment portfolio, which again, at the beginning wasn't large, but now is much more substantial to make sure that she is opting in and investing in companies that have women on the board, that have women in C-suite, that promote women and pay, pay women fairly, because a lot of this information is public, right, now. So we're seeing this more and more, especially in 2020 with everything that's going on around social, social injustice and Black Lives Matter, we're seeing a lot of people wanting to spend, spend, spend and support black businesses, which is great, but we take it a step further, think about your, in, your investments and impact investing is very real and it's very achievable for everyone, no matter how much wealth you have. You just have to take, you know, you have to be willing to be intentional and spend a little bit more time doing your homework. Um, well, I think that that's absolutely wonderful advice. As you know, I work in the um, nonprofit sector and uh, a lot of times uh, I'll be talking with people and no one actually has that conversation with them. They may, they, they're, they're grasping for uh, what's a good thing for me to, to, to support, uh, why? I mean, mm -hmm. it's just no one actually sits down and says, let me find out what your values are, what is important to you, and then let's look for organizations and groups that are doing the kind of work that would resonate with what it is that your interests are. And I think that that, right. that, 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 that makes an awful lot of sense um, um, as we consider uh, what folks uh, really are confronting when they when they have to figure out what to do with the with the funds that they have at their disposal. Um, you also mentioned when you when you were talking about women and girls, are there unique issues that people of color? I mean, as a woman of color yourself, um, you, um, you you bring a special insight into this issue. But do you find at, as you're talking with uh, particularly women of color, but just non non traditional folks in America, um, what, what, kinds of, what kinds of issues do you see that get raised with you and what kinds of special advice or counsel do you provide? Are you referring to when it comes to their investments about what issues are important to them? Maybe that as well as just the whole question of whether or not they should get involved in the investment world in the first place. Mm -hmm. So everyone always wants to talk about investments, right? Um, because they want to talk about how investments are going to um, yes, 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 yes. basically provide them with additional income, but they also want to look for the safest things and what has the best return. But I do think that, you know, naturally because of the type of advisor I am and how I'm, you know, really out on the forefront about where my values are, I think I'm naturally attracting a lot of those that are interested and you'd be surprised Charlie. Really. we're seeing a lot more of this from people that aren't people of color and aren't women they are looking how they can redirect their investments to support things around diversity and inclusion so your team has been you have a philosophy that guides the team that you put together and it's um it's one of, one of your goals is elevating your clients to elevate your clients and in, in in the broader context of what we've been talking about so far i would i'm sort of making a generalization that all of these themes sort of in, are embedded in the way that all of your team members are thinking about the relationships that they have we are with your um, with your clients, um, could you say a little bit more about what does elevating your clients mean when you use that term? Right. No, thank you. I mean, I, I as you know, as you recognize, and most people um, on the phone probably do too. There are not a lot of women and and women of color in financial services, right? Um, in in wealth management, they're few and far between. And then when you think about serving the high net worth and the ultra high net worth community, they're almost non-existent. So the world has changed, America has changed, the face of wealth has changed, but our industry has not. And so I wanted to really think about how can I better serve clients by creating a team that represented this purpose, you know, this purpose driven, this impact oriented philosophy, where we're trying to help our clients really do well by doing good at the same time, and it is possible. So to do that, 
you know, it's really curating, obviously, the most smart, the smartest and most talented individuals in the industry, but making it a place where they can show up as themselves and also where we have very diverse backgrounds and perspectives that are appreciated, you know, recognized, celebrated, because the more diverse voices, as you, as you know, Charlie, we've talked about this before, that you have in a room together, the, the better ideas that are going to be generated, right? The more outside of the box thinking as it, re, as it relates to what clients are experiencing, but also it brings a different level of empathy and care and compassion to the relationships when we're talking about different situations that people are going through as it relates to their money, which is incredibly, you know, very personal. personal. So for me, it's really about how can I find the smartest, most diverse people, but also those that have these shared values. And while that may seem easy, it's, it's very hard because I'm looking for the people that get it. Mm -hmm. The people that are going to be asking these questions around impact and really want to serve and really want to make it be about being an advocate for our clients. So, you know, it's, it's been exciting, um, but it's also been a, it's been a unique year, right? Because I, I started this in, in January. So it's definitely been different. Well, I, I know we chatted a little bit um, previously, earlier, not today, and a couple of days ago, and you said that, you know, my conversations with everyone doesn't result in them ending up having me as their coach, you know, their advisor. Um, it may be, maybe the best advice I, I can give them is to say that they should probably talk to someone else that might resonate more with what they're doing. And I just think that that's a, that's a great uh, perspective to bring to the whole enterprise because uh, to me I think having the trust and the confidence of the people that you're working with and knowing that they're working in your, in your own best interest is is wonderful and I think that's that resonates to elevating your clients when people feel that way they're happy and, and you're happy as well um, I want to get back. It goes back to Charlie sorry yes. it goes back to Charlie the whole concept of what TC teaches us right as students as employees as a community is yes. that we're here to empower and educate. And I think that, you know, in my industry, um, that's not always how we're all thought of. And that's, and I want to change what that looks like. I think that that's great. Um, well, uh, you, you were actually talking about this financial literacy issue at large. And at TC, they were mm -hmm. they have a program, I think it's called the Teachers College Cowan Financial Literacy uh, pro Program, which is building into the teaching of, uh, future teachers at TC, an awareness of financial literacy so that when they get into their classrooms, they can create the kind of environment with their students that you created with your children, making them at ease with that, uh, with saving and recognizing that things in the future uh, will come as a result of think, uh, thinking that they, uh, that they have around saving and planning for the future. So do you think that, these, that this kind of financial literacy training such as TC is providing to its students should be more universally applied and have more young people in and teaches more aware of this as we go along. Absolutely. I actually have to sit in on um, that program, and I did, and it's fantastic because they teach everything through a case study method, which I think is very helpful for people to relate to because financial concepts can feel very overwhelming, but they really shouldn't, right? These are really practical life types of um, events and circumstances that we're going through. But I do think teachers, parents, teachers, any type of care providers, the teachers have this special role in the eyes of a student, right? And I think that it doesn't have to be a specific financial literacy curriculum that the teacher is teaching, but through everyday things that they're showing in their classroom and can have dialogue, right? If it's a history teacher talking about the history of the bank system or anything of that nature. But I think by providing our teachers with financial literacy information or just education for themselves, can you imagine how much more empowered they'd be to then just share it with their communities, other educators, and then their students? I definitely think there's a bigger need for it. And I think that the Cowan Center, what they're doing is, is fantastic. I, I agree entirely. And uh, I was um, so happy when I saw that this program was embedded into the efforts that are taking place at TC. And I think that teachers who not only share this with their students, but they also share it with the, with the parents of their students. And I, um, right. I would just say uh, my program specifically works with low income and new immigrant families. And what I always say is, you know, savings for your children is an inherent, inherently forward looking activity. So if you're saving for your children, you have an expectation and an aspiration for them that lies years ahead. And kids know that just as you said with your own children, they know when you're saving for something that in the future, 
that it could be beneficial to them that has a, a very positive impact on them. So I'm so happy mm -hmm. that EP is doing that and I'm glad that you, um, you took the time to give it a good strong endorsement today. So Rosella, I understand that you have some questions from our audience. But. I just want to take a minute to thank you both for that really incredible discussion and the conversation. It was just, I think, gave us a lot of really great things to think about. And I really appreciate your points about us being intentional and impactful with our personal investments. And I know just from reading the chat, you know, that we're scrolling through, that resonated with a lot of our viewers as well. And um, you've given us so many great things to think about, a lot of best practices to focus on as we work on our own financial futures, but let's go ahead and transition to some Q&A and see um, what we've received uh, so far. And thank you very much for those of you that sent in questions in advance. So let's kick things off with a question that I'm gonna ask for both of you. Um, in terms of, I think, uh, our first generation Americans or our underrepresented minorities that are perhaps just getting started, might not have family wealth or an inheritance to rely on. How can they set themselves up for success in their financial planning? I, I, let me, Charlie. I'll give a quick response because this is something that um, in my program, we work with 1400 families across the Commonwealth and it comes up a lot of times. And uh, one of the things that I respond to when I say that is that saving, as I said, is this inherent forward oriented, forward looking type of an activity. And there's been a lot of research on parents who save. It's, it's not how much parents save for low income families. Uh, the research says low income families who save for their children to go to college, even if it's $500 or less, even if it's $500 or less, are three times more likely to send their kids to college. And once their kids get there, they are four times more likely to graduate than low-income kids who didn't have parents who saved. So the issue is kids know when parents are saving for them. They know when they're sacrificing for them. And when they get to college, they don't want to let their parents down. They know what they went through in order to um, get them where they are. So my point is, I don't think we should focus exclusively on you have to have a million dollars in the bank. I think it's important that we make an effort to show that we're saving for something that's important. And that's the result that makes a difference in my opinion. That's great. I'm gonna answer this, I think in a little bit of a different way. And it, it's um, providing some advice that I wish I knew earlier on, but soon learned it rather quickly having lived um, in New York. Um, three things that I, I typically tell people that are in similar circumstances, because I am that exact description, right? Underrepresented, um, I was a little bit younger than my 30s, first gen, would be the, these three things, right? Surrounding yourself or creating, building a team around you that's going to invest, help to support you and educate you um, with your, your um, with similar values or with your best interests at heart. And I mentioned this before, but I'm, I'm really, really adamant about that. And it doesn't have to be an advisor like me, it can be, you know, the local teller at the branch that seems like they're very well versed and they know about, you know, financial situations. It's maybe, um, you know, an accountant at H&R Block that you go to as opposed to doing it on your own because they're going to give you those tips to save, right? Um, but just really surrounding yourself with a team of people and it looks a little bit different as your career grows. Um, to make sure that you're making the right decisions. And it can also be, say, an econ, you know, professor or somebody who's in the math and education department, um, somebody actually I recently spoke to, on um, the professor at TC. I mean, think about it in non-traditional ways. Definitely not part of your team is that friend that has you buy every dinner or that tries to encourage you to spend, right? So also think about who you're shedding from that, that team. Um, and then in that team, accountability partners. So I know I have a very close girlfriend who still lives in New York and she would call me out on a number of things, right? So it's somebody who knows what your financial plan looks like or at least what your goals are and tries to hold you accountable. Often that changes to be your spouse or you know, your, who is your most intimate partner um, in life. Um, the second thing I would say is be an informed consumer. Don't invest in anything, don't buy anything, don't spend money on anything that you do not understand and be willing to ask the question. So if you have a credit card, if you have a student loan, now is a great time actually to call out of these places, talk down those rates, right? Ask, the worst thing they can say is no. Um, call anywhere where you have any kind of debt and see if you can get a lower payment, a lower interest rate, whatever it is, but just make sure you're an informed consumer and doing your homework. And then the third thing that directly relates to that is making sure you understand what your worth is. Yeah. And what that means is 
If you are applying for a job, understand what other people in that same space are getting paid and ask for it or ask for more. Understand what the benefit package is that you're getting, the ins and outs of it, and understand really what, if they're actually compensating you for what your worth is. Um, because I think that's the biggest mistake we can make early on is going for negotiating or not negotiating a very low salary. And then that salary kind of haunts you for years and years and years of your life. Cause you can never make like, especially if you're moving internally within a company, it's very hard to get beyond that. So building the right team, right. Being an informed consumer and then knowing your worth. Those are really great and just relatable tips and things that we can follow. And I think a nuts and bolts question kind of related to that in terms of being an informed consumer that we've received is where can someone go to educate themselves on what it might cost them like to find the right financial coach, you know, so where would they be able to understand like how much they should be spending for sort of where their investment level is? Yeah, that's a great question and it really varies depending on what type of advisor you're hiring. So the reason why I, I went back to a few times, if you already are um, have in a retirement plan for your company or your corporation or even your school, usually with, if you're a teacher or an educator, it's usually TIA or CRAC, right? There's usually a 1-800 number and or there's usually a representative signed to your institution. So every time they come in, they may do office hours, take advantage of that. Don't be the person who never knows what they're invested in or how much they're contributing and doesn't understand it. Take advantage of that because that person is already paying, being paid by your institution, right? So you don't have an additional fee there. That's kind of free advice. I mean, that is free advice. So take advantage of that. The same with the, the tellers or the advisors that are sitting within your local bank. You shouldn't be paying them extra unless they're actually investing in something for you but the local teller isn't getting paid extra. Um, and so are those other specialists. So it's looking creatively and finding ways to get the advice you need and not being afraid to look up certain things on your own that may be simpler. But typically in our world, you know, it really varies in the type of institution you're with, but it can be anywhere from one and a half percent. Um, and then it can go down from there depending on how much you have in access, but it really, really varies. So if you have a specific circumstance you want me to look at or just get advice from me, you can always reach out. Fantastic. And we'll be sharing um, in a follow-up email a link to Maya's website so that you can get um, connected or find some more resources that she has available. And um, one other thing that kind of um, came up in one of our previous questions that you mentioned as the, the top three things to keep in mind there is knowing your worth and sort of the idea of negotiating for your salary, but kind of that idea of the salary, right? So one of the questions we've received is, what would your advice be if someone was, you know, trying to balance weighing the options of going with their dream job in a startup versus taking a steady paying job that they might not be as passionate about? What would your advice be in that situation? Oh, Charlie, you want to go first on that one? Um, I, I actually have a good story <laughs> that I'll tell about this because I thought it was funny. I was, when I was at University of Massachusetts where I was associate chancellor and I had been at UMass for a long time, I'm old enough to say I had been there a long time. And um, I was working with um, a philanthropist who was funding some projects and that I was very involved with in school, community, university collaboration. And I was going to, so it's sort of towards the end of my career. And I said, um, you know, um, I've been at UMass all, all these years. I can live out the rest of my life here. I, I really think, I should, what do you think I should do? I, I mean, I've been thinking about leaving it to do something else. And so she looked at me, said, I think you should leave and do something else. You, you, you don't get these choices very often. I, I promise you that you'll be happy if you did. So I retired from UMass. Two and a half weeks after I, I retired from UMass, she made me the executive vice president of her foundation. <laughs> so, so sometimes oh, wow. you step off yeah. the ledge and open yourself up and be open for what the, the opportunities that are available to you. Don't follow your dreams and do something sometimes that's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's great advice. Um, and I definitely think that's applicable to those that um, are maybe individuals, right? In this circumstance, Charlie, were you, were you did you have dependents or what was your situation? I was a little bit later in my, 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 my a little bit later in life. So my kids were, you know, paying school loans and stuff like that, but not early on. Okay. It's two, four and six, right? <laughs> yeah. So I, so that's where I was going with that. So for me, I did take a bigger rest, right? In, in January, when I made the leap to start my own team, 
but I was, I was ready to bet on myself and really it was bigger. I was ready to bet on my values. So I think it all comes down to what your circumstance is, because I'm not going to ever tell somebody don't take the steady job if you need the health care insurance for your children. If you're the sole provider, if everything is relying upon you, you should go with that steady job because that steady job is actually looking a lot better than the other situation. Yes. But if you are in a place where you're feeling incredibly compromised that you can't realize your impact, your purpose, or you feel like your values and your integrity are being compromised, you have to make that change now because it's not worth your emotional state because it will eat you up every day. And then other things will start being compromised, including the habits and the financial decisions that you make. You'll start shortchanging yourself in other ways. So I think it really depends, um, which is probably not the response that, you know, whoever is asking this question is wanting, but it really, it really does depend if you, depending on, you know, the other um, people in your life. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. And I think speaks to, you know, how you started this conversation about really thinking about this as financial coaching, right? Like you really have to, to take some of that on and look within to, to kind of think about what's right for you and at those times. And we do have a couple more questions that have come in related to, you know, family obligations, responsibilities. So um, one in particular um, that asks if you have any suggestions about how to navigate childcare spending as well as saving for the future education of, of children and, and how might that relate to the 50, 30, 20 um, sort of uh, budget that you kind of laid out earlier. And we started off, we started off the conversation with this. I feel very fortunate that I am not in the same circumstance as my parents. I came from a family with five children and my parents had children young, right? And so we kind of, in a way, watched each other. Um, and my grandmother was very involved, thankfully. But, you know, I look at my situation now and I just feel quite thankful that I can afford a babysitter, right? Because a lot of people can't. And with childcare being one of the largest expenses, it is very challenging. So the first piece of advice I would give is to make sure that you're maxing out or taking advantage of any type of plan, like flex saving plan, if you have one at your company because a lot of companies allow you to contribute up to you know five thousand dollars combined um, if there are two um, adults in the household through your two respective companies and then you can uh, utilize that towards child care but you're only really paying like half of it because there's some tax savings so look at anything you can through your through your um, employer and then the other thing i would think about is right that's an essential cost so when I talked about this 50, 30, 20, it's essential. Your children are your biggest asset. You cannot make a mistake with them. You can't put them in harm's way, which you, you likely would never, but you, that's not something you can skimp on, right? So it might be that the 529 or the, the education fund doesn't get funded, at least for those first couple of years, to make sure that child's care, getting the best adequate care. Um, I know that I've advised people to maybe stay working at you know, I, know, I work with a lot of people that work in higher education to stay working in higher education because a lot of universities have access to childcare at a, at a, that are very high standards, but at a lower cost, subsidized, sometimes non-existent. Um, and the same goes for people in the healthcare space. So think a little bit creatively about your career journey. I know this sounds weird, but to take advantage of where you are in your life um, and those different circumstances to allow yourself to, to breathe a little bit. Childcare is incredibly expensive. Let me just footnote to say that um, this is another one of those value choices that you have to make in the sense that um, ultimately, if you're saving money, it's, you, you, you're saying, I'm trying to make this money so I can do what? I want to take that money to do wonderful things for my children, my family and my children. Well, maybe it's a better investment to spend that money on a quality childcare right now when it can make the most difference in the developmental stages of your child. You can get back on track with the savings later for you know the summer retreats and summer vacations and whatever. It's better to make those investments so that your children are getting the foundational support that they need to be the whole selves that they are potentially capable of being. And that those are the best investments you'll ever make. That's such a good point, Charlie. Thank you for adding that. And we've had a few questions come up sort of stemming from the, the, you know, the same line of, of having the responsibilities to manage that are kind of in your immediate future, but thinking about saving for retirement, right? And so a couple of questions specifically related to maximizing your 403B, but sort of even thinking beyond that, like 
are there situations where you might consider personal investing um, at a higher rate of return outside of utilizing your company's 403B or the retirement plan that they have in place? Um, so what would you suggest in that situation? So this is why a financial plan is so important. Um, and it doesn't have to, again, it doesn't have to be a sophisticated plan, but understanding what your income looks like, your after-tax income, and then understanding what your goals are. So when it comes to your retirement, I absolutely always suggest that people put as much as they possibly can in their retirement plan at wherever they are after they ensure that they have the emergency fund. Because I think what tends to happen is, and I see this a lot, especially with people that are first coming up, is that we, we end up dipping into our 403B or 401K for things that aren't that are emergencies, which we really should have had an emergency fund for. So not only are we pulling that out of our retirement, but we're, all, we're, we're teaching ourselves that it's accessible, which it really shouldn't be, but we're also paying a penalty. So it's thinking about through this financial plan, creating an emergency fund, maxing out anything you can or putting as much as you can into the retirement plan so you at least take advantage of the match if there's a match. Then if you can go beyond the match, maxing out the 19,500, which is what the allowable amount is in 20, you know, in 2020, depending on your age. And then the next step I would suggest is an IRA, an outside IRA, which you can have, and you can contribute up to 6,000, which receives, you know, similar tax benefits. So you're trying to look for ways to invest and save that's going to benefit you from a tax perspective first. Um, and then going further would be a separate investment account. So you really just need to prioritize and it really you're, it would change depending on if you have dependents or if you have other people that rely upon you. Prioritizing early on looks very different, but also very similar later on, right? We, I have three children, but we also have to take care of a grandmother and a great grandmother. So it's prioritizing, you know, how you fund each goal and where your income is going to be, where, where your income is going to be steered toward. But it comes back to Char Charlie's point on values. Anything to add there, Charlie? I thought she did a brilliant job. <laughs> and it, it kind of ties into another question that we've seen. And I think um, that was a really great answer, especially for planning for the long term, right? In terms of retirement and um, the, the idea of setting those goals and, and prioritizing them along the way. How would you suggest that someone might most effectively save for a short term, excuse me, a medium term goal, which might be like a home um, down payment or a short term goal, which would probably be those emergencies that you sort of um, alluded to. How could you give us some like specific strategies on how folks can save um, for those situations as well? So when you're coming up with your financial plan or wealth plan or whatever you, you want to call it for yourself, it's basically think about it as like your financial vision board in a way. When you come up with those goals, your short-term, mid-term, long-term goals, I like to bucket them, essential, important, and aspirational. And then I say, okay, this is my income, you know, 50% of it should go toward, as, you know, my essential needs, not, not my essential goals. And then I have, you know, the 30% that might go toward my wants. That's where I kind of dictate out, okay, which one of these goals am I going to try to fund? And at what rate, right? That's only can be determined about by you, by what you think is most important. And then when you go back to that 20%, the 20% is, right, that's more around savings and investments. So those are longer term. So those wouldn't necessarily be your short term and midterm, but those are your longer term, like retirement and things of that nature. So again, it's prioritizing your goals, essential, important, and aspirational, and then funding them according to what you, where you're ready to, you know, give and take. The one thing I would say is when it comes to savings, we can put a number to it. We can say 20%, but I think that if it's not uncomfortable, if your savings number isn't uncomfortable, you're not saving enough. If it is not uncomfortable, you're not saving enough, especially in your early years where you don't, if you don't have dependents that rely upon you, force yourself to give up a few extra things a week. We're all doing it during COVID, so it should be easy enough now to know what you can live without. That's such a great tip. Yeah, I'll also just quickly say that the issue is, which is where I feel, feel the coaching is so, so important, is to understanding the power of wealth. What wealth enables you to do things that you, if you have wealth, you're able to do things for yourself and for generations to come. And so the sacrifices that you have to make uh, to 
recognize what do I have to do to create this um, body of wealth that will enable me to do the things that I want to do for myself and also be able to remove obstacles that, that I know coming down the road are going to be in the way of my children and my grandchildren. And if you're thinking about that and prioritizing that, it makes it easier to make those choices about is this essential or is it important or is it something that's just an aspirational thing I should be thinking about. Absolutely. Right. I mean, and Charlie, even as it relates to people in your community, right? That was a big thing for me. So many people, I had so many different community-based scholarships to get to undergrad, to get to grad school and to get to do, I did an MBA too. For me, it was how can I lift my community up at the same time? So yeah. it's creating wealth so I can create scholarships. Yes. So I can en enable other yeah. people like people enabled me. That's really important for me. So my wealth, my financial plan may look very different than somebody else's around goals and savings because yes, I'm saving for my children, but it's not all going to go to them. That's right. Because yeah, it's you know, so much more than our family unit. That's an absolutely such an important thing, particularly for those, I mean, I'm a trustee at TC. And so I have to say, mm -hmm. if it wasn't for folks who have had advisors and have had opportunities to have save and to have resources that enable them to make those scholarships available so that people can go out and become high powered teachers and make big changes in communities. Uh, those are just the wonderful things. Again, the values, those are the things that are worth sacrificing for the ability to be able to do things like that, to see that you can make a difference in the world and have impact in the broader world. Um, worth sacrificing for. Absolutely. Yeah, I think this has been a very, um, you know, different and real approach to, um, you know, one's thoughts about financial planning. It's not focusing on that yacht, you know, 30 years down the line. It's really thinking about what's important to you, what are your values, and, and how you can keep that front and center. And, and as Maya said, lift your community and um, support others that need support. So I think you have given us all um, just some really great things to think about. And I know we could go on and there's so many more questions, but I am mindful of time because I know the two of you are also very busy. So thank you so much, Maya and Charlie, for sharing these extremely helpful um, you know, tips and best practices and really helping us to kind of focus our intentions so that we can be impactful with our investments and, and really build some confidence as we move forward in, in our uh, financial plan. So thank you very much and we appreciate your expertise. And for those of you online, Alumni Relations is hosting many more digital events in the coming weeks and months. So please stay tuned to emails from TC Alumni Relations, as well as our social media channels. And we look forward to seeing you at a future event. Thank you very much, Charlie and Maya. And we look forward to seeing you at future events as well. So thank you all thank for being you. here. Have a great day.